So I have PCOS. It's a condition that affects 10% of people who menstruate. Maybe you've heard about endometriosis. Well, PCOS is in the same category of diseases, but we don't talk about it as much. What it means is that I have cysts on my ovaries. And so at around 20, I started developing adult acne. I lost a lot of hair and my periods became irregular and even disappeared for an entire year. Before I started developing the symptoms, I had never gone to an ob grind, but I eventually did, primarily because I wanted to get rid of the acne, which made me insanely insecure, and I was told that the pill could help. So I was examined by the ob grind, and the whole situation felt quite weird and uncomfortable. I felt a bit paralyzed and incapable of understanding or communicating how I felt. The ob told me that I had PCOS, so I had cysts on my ovaries and I would struggle to have kids. That nothing could be done except take the pill, which is what I ended up doing. I left the building, it felt like everything happened super duper fast. I had never thought about if I wanted babies or not, but all of a sudden the if disappeared. I sat in my car and felt my shoulders relax a little bit. I thought I would just take the pill for my acne and not think about the rest. And then one year later, I would say, I went to another ob uh, who reassured me that my PCOS would not prevent me from having kids. And it made me realize how awful my experience with the other ob was. I stopped taking the pill two years ago, I would say. I didn't want to have to take it every day and I wanted a non-hormonal form of contraception. I was so scared that when I would stop, my acne would come back, that the PCOS symptoms would come back even stronger, but nothing happened. I actually left the take the pill daily reminder on my Google calendar and I still have a tab in my wallet to remind me of how much I hated having to take the pill acne pill, so a pill day is quite strong. Now more and more people like me share their bad experiences with the pill, uh, with ob -Gynes. They share the physical and psychological violence that they have faced. Now I know that sharing my experience in the hope that other women won't have to face the same issues is a good thing. But I'm also aware of how complex the politics of the pill are, how complex the politics of reproduction are, and that's precisely why I'm making this video, you see. For a long time, I kind of refused to talk about this topic because I felt like any criticism or nuance on the topic would have the effect of diverting people from using the pill, which for now remains one of the most accessible and effective contraception method. So that means the most accessible and effective way of avoiding unintended pregnancy. But I came to the conclusion that if we refuse to be critical about the politics of the pill, then others will. But I knew girls that were on birth control for pimples and I always remember thinking like that's so weird like they could have sex right now and they wouldn't get pregnant like why was I thinking about that well because it's unnatural it is and then it's like we started with the pill and now I hear of these women that are getting you know devices and they're not going to get their period for three years yeah I'm like at what point does your brain come online and just mm -hmm. go that don't sound right this video isn't just about contraception it's about how this thing has become central to the anti-feminist backlash it's about how this thing has become a gateway to conservatism. Okay, I'm really excited for this video. If you talk about birth control, the basic idea is that it does nothing to your body, it just stops you from having babies. That doesn't Hormonal birth control has been proven to increase the risk of blood clots and stroke. Increase that being on the pill can cause early abortions. It's like identify the issues as the pill. It's extremely yeah. problematic, yeah. Especially triumph of birth control. It's the hydrogen bomb. Since the reversal of Roe v. Wade, the politics of reproduction have become a regular topic of discussion in US media. Pro-abortion advocates, organizations, and journalists have adapted to the situation by developing contraception awareness. That means that if we struggle to find places to get an abortion, at least we can make sure that we avoid the unwanted pregnancies at an earlier stage. Mainstream liberal media, in particular, has taken on that role. The New York Times and Washington Post have talked a lot about the pill. To the point where some people became a bit skeptical. Like, look at this video that I found when I was uh, researching. I was on the birth control to Prozac to chronic illness pipeline. And I got off that pipeline. And a lot of people are getting off that pipeline. And pharma, pharma's a little upset. Want to know who owns the Washington Post? Jeff Beeswax. Jeff Beeswax. He owns the Washington Post. 
Why does this matter? This article is from 2020, but Amazon launches online pharmacy. The world's richest man and CEO of Amazon, Jeff Beeswax, has decided to further expand Amazon's offerings. Amazon is set to offer a digital pharmacy. So this is not the entire video, but I want to pause that. So basically what Fiona explains is that the Washington Post belongs to Jeff Bezos. And because of that, the coverage as a pro-Big Pharma bias and therefore a pro-pill bias. Basically what she says is the article is meant to sell you the pill, so don't trust it. Now let's take a look at the article. The authors presents the rise of contraception misinformation on social media, which leads to an anti-pill backlash, which is not ideal in a post-Roe v. Wade America where having access to effective and cheap contraception is critical, especially for working class women and racial minorities who are the most likely to have an unintended pregnancy. The authors recognize that the research on contraception or women's health in general is limited and that there is a lack of education in terms of what contraception is best and what are the different options that you have. So you can tell that they believe that the most important thing to do right now is to facilitate access to the pill because it's the most reliable and accessible option, especially for working class women, especially for women of racial minorities. In the article, they also tend to discredit uh, natural methods that demand time, consistency, and the comfort of taking an extra risk. That's why mostly middle and upper class women choose those options. The authors also showed that self-taught experts on natural birth control methods can spread misinformation to large audiences, can be motivated by a desire to make a lot of money, or can be instrumentalized uh, by conservatives. So I finished the article thinking, that's good journalism. It's not perfect, that's for sure, but it's a pretty good job. Then two days later, I was on Instagram and I saw another article from the Washington Post on contraception, this one. Again, the article was relatively good. The journalist explained that ob gynes uh, can underestimate the pain that IUD cause and that more research is needed to alleviate that pain. She still explained that IUD is effective and that sure, we see a lot of negative experiences on social media, but we tend to just see that, the negative. In fact, when I shared the article on Instagram, I did receive a lot of DMs of people either validating or contradicting the negative experiences. In the end, the two Washington Post articles come to similar conclusions. We need to invest more in women's health and we need to listen and take women's experiences seriously. Now, the reason why I made this quite long tangent is because our very legitimate skepticism towards mainstream media can sometimes prevent us from recognizing relatively good journalistic work, like it is the case in these two articles. You see, Fiona asks us to be super skeptical, which is exactly what I did. I checked who she was on social media and what she was doing and so that she runs a wellness business to help you enter your optimized era with one-to-one -one coaching. And she also promotes a natural healing training program to become like Deborah, Jordan, or Anne, an NTP, BCHN, RWP, basically a bunch of letters that make it sound like you're an expert despite not having any medical school qualifications. So if I follow Fiona's logic, then I should completely disregard anything she says since her content aligns with and promotes her natural healing business. She can't be trusted. She's just trying to make money out of me. I'll add a little something just to avoid any misunderstandings. I've been one of those people who turn to the internet to compensate for the lack of information I received from my ob regarding PCOS. And while some of the information I found online helped me, I saw that the line between legitimate resources and misinformation was super thin. As a young person, it was easy for me to fall in the trap. And let's be honest, there are a lot of traps. That's why I think that both the Washington Post articles and Fiona's skepticism are valid, but both also have limitations. So the problem isn't so much the Washington Post articles taken individually, but rather the editorial choices of mainstream liberal media. The pill gets great coverage on those papers, it's a fact. But there are a lot of negative things to say about the pill. Now, liberal media seems to avoid being too critical about it because one, they support and are supported by Big Pharma, Fiona was right about this, and two, they see it as the most effective solution against the abortion bans. So we're stuck in a situation where making a case against the pill has become too risky, too inconsiderate, given the state of reproductive rights. And you know what, this whole situation reminded me of something Naomi Klein said in Doppelganger. She explained that during the panoramic, 
anti-capitalist failed to properly criticize the role Big Pharma was playing in all of this because we were too scared this would be considered as on TV or understood as such. So we just aligned with what mainstream pro-Big Pharma media said because the necessity was to save as many lives as possible. But the suspicion around how Big Pharma benefited from the panoramic did not disappear. It was captured by far-right conspiracy theorists, the Bannon and the Naomi Wolf. The media is lying to you, they said. They are bought by Big Pharma. Bill Gates wants to take away your freedom. They are watching you. The same thing is happening with the pill. I mean, look at what Brittany Martinez, for example, the founder of Heavy Magazine, a Gen Z conservative feminine energy magazine, says, quote, Women have been silenced and shamed by legacy media, the pharmaceutical industry, and in many cases by their own doctors who have gaslit them about their experiences with hormonal birth control, end of the quote. What she's saying isn't necessarily wrong. The suspicion is legitimate. But that suspicion gets co-opted to push a conservative, anti-feminist agenda. Martinez was interviewed by Natalie Winters, the co-host of Steve Bannon's War Room. It's a network, they're all connected to each other through their conservatism. The pill has become their favorite target because nobody's talking about women's bad experiences seriously. Anti-pill sentiments are becoming a gateway to conservatism for a growing number of women. The journalist Louise Berry best represents that phenomenon. Let me show you some clips of the things uh, she says. When motherhood became a biological choice for women, fatherhood became a social choice for men. It became socially acceptable for men to walk away from children in a way that it hadn't been before. You know, 99% of men can kill 99% of women with their bare hands and not vice versa. We have to operate with that, with that recognition. Chivalry in those circumstances is obviously in women's interests. So yeah, Louise Perry is a journalist for the Daily Mail and the New Statement. I've talked about her in my liberal feminism video, but there are so many things to say about um, this woman that I could do an entire series, to be honest. So Perry is not as open about her conservatism as someone like Brett Cooper, uh, Michaela Peterson, or Candace Owens would. But she validates all their points. She lets them talk, say reactionary stuff, and gently nods. She explains that before the pill was invented, Women had to self-regulate to avoid getting pregnant. They took sex very seriously, like a proper lady would, up until the pill was invented and everyone could then behave unusually, as she says. The unusually is the problem here. Perry believes that a sexually liberated woman is not respectable. A respectable woman should regulate her sexuality to keep the body count as low as possible, to make sure that sex is as related as possible to reproduction. In turn, her restrained sexuality gives her good reputation. It's a social currency. Because of what she says, you could think that Louise Perry is a fan of natural methods of contraception, but no. Um, I also know so many women who've got pregnant from doing that accidentally. It doesn't work that well, it doesn't work that well. So no pill, no natural methods, just going back to the good old days where women would dread that having sex leads to pregnancy. Because yes, Perry, people have sex. They've always had sex. Even when women didn't necessarily want to have sex, men had sex with them. And then women had to secretly get an abortion or face the shame for their unrespectable tendencies. I mean, is it too hard to open a goddamn history book for a second? Like seriously, you're a journalist, Perry. I mean, how can these common sense feminists say they care about women or just call themselves feminists if they want to go back to the times where women were blamed and shamed for their sexuality, a time where women were silenced and chained to preserve their and their family's reputation, we've come such a long way and Perry's like, nope, you're gonna have to stop using contraception. And if you don't wanna have babies, then stop having sex. And if your high testosterone boyfriend or husband forces you to have sex because he expects you to fulfill his needs, then pray not to get pregnant. And if you eventually get pregnant, then don't even think about getting an abortion. What a disgrace would that be? That is the reality our great-grandmothers, grandmothers, and for some mothers lived with. It's awful. Having access to the pill or abortion saved millions of women, mothers and grandmothers, from the constant anxiety of unintended pregnancy. It saved them from pushy boyfriends and husbands who didn't care about their lack of consent. But it doesn't even stop there. Perry also connects the rise of single motherhood to the pill. That's what she meant with the quote, when women choose to have babies or not with contraception, men can just walk away and give up on their father duties. Well, Perry's solution to that issue seems to be to lock couples into marriage. In an interview she did for The Spectator, subtitled, quote, 
Fraser Nelson speaks to Louis Perry about why more people should be getting married and why it should be harder to get divorced. So in that video, Perry looked back on the Divorce Reform Act of 1969 as the marker of the beginning of a new era she cannot help but badly connote, the post-sexual revolution era. The act was revolutionary because it enabled partners to file for no-fault divorce. So after 1968, divorce rates increased tremendously, but that's a good thing because unhappy couples were finally allowed to legally end their marriage. Now, here's another clip I want to show you. Generally quite sceptical of the idea of um, of people having this, like absolute agency or absolute... I mean, we, we do clearly have... We do clearly have free will. But I think that what we consider to be desirable, normal, the life template is so incredibly dependent on what other people around us think. Mm. Gosh, this goes handmade tales. Actually, I have uploaded me and my friends' uh, reaction to this video on Patreon. If you want to check that, there's a link down below. So yeah, Perry isn't a fan of any contraception method, hormonal, natural. And she complains about people having absolute agency to divorce or not, to have a baby or not, to have an abortion or not. Why? Because she's religious, yes. But also because she thinks that we won't be able to replace our population birth rates started really crashing in recent decades, that people would just spontaneously decide once they had access to contraception or whatever to have 2.1 kids. The fear of a great replacement is spreading quite fast. Earlier this year, my president Macron explained that France needed a rearmement démographique. French women need to make more babies, basically. Fertility has to increase. Now that's the sort of thing the far right usually talks about. During the 2022 French presidential campaign, Zemmour explained that he would give 10k for every kid born in a rural family. Marine Le Pen has also talked a lot about the need to increase natality to counter the Great Replacement, aka people of African or Arab descent make too many babies and soon the Christian white civilization is going to be replaced. Finally, the recent Alabama's case is yet another example of the conservative fear of replacement. Three couples filed a lawsuit against a fertility clinic after their frozen embryos for IVF were destroyed. A lower court ruled that the embryos could not be defined as people or children and dismissed the wrongful death claim. However, in a 7-2 ruling, the all-Republican Alabama Supreme Court disagreed. Citing Bible verses and an 1872 state law called the Wrongful Death of a Minor Act, Justice J. Mitchell declared parents may sue over the death of a child, regardless of whether the child is born or unborn. Now, in case you didn't know, IVF is a very common practice, which is mostly done by white, middle and upper class women, and it has the support of a large majority of GOP voters. Because of that, Donald Trump eventually stepped into the conversation. He said, The Republican Party will always support the creation of strong, thriving, healthy American families. So eventually, a bill was voted to protect the clinics from the um, Supreme Court ruling. You know, as a European, I always try to bring nuance when fellow Europeans call Americans dumb. But there are cases where that task is particularly difficult. In fact, conservatives constantly switch between pro and against life, according to their nationalist, white supremacist agenda. Don't forget that on multiple occasions, conservatives took away the right to have a baby from millions of women. Black women were sterilized during the 20s and 30s, other ethnicities were targeted. White women of the working class were also sterilized during the Great Depression. And even during the 60s and 70s, a lot of women receiving benefits were forced to be sterilized to keep getting money. So, to conclude this first part, we saw that liberal media is only doing 50% of the work because of private interest, it seems. The left struggled to position itself on the issue because of a fear that their anti-Big Pharma rhetoric will be understood as being anti-pill, which is not ideal when, after decades of promoting the Big Pharma pill in mainstream media and not doing the research for alternatives, that very pill appears to be the most effective solution to the abortion bans that primarily affect working class and minority women. The gap left then gets exploited by the holistic girl bosses who make a lot of money off of misinformation and the far right who has its nationalist, anti-freedom, conservative agenda. Now, you know I spend a lot of time on the internet and the more I think about it, the more it appears to me that the anti-bill rhetoric has become a gateway towards conservatism the same way that the Manosphere did. 
You see, in the past five years, the manosphere has drawn a lot of men to conservatism. Young men are drawn first and foremost to the lifestyle and status of manosphere men, and are then introduced to the political stuff, the misogyny, the right-wing ideas. Maybe you've seen this graph, it's circulated a lot lately, and it shows that young men increasingly vote conservative and young women increasingly vote liberal. This can be explained in part, and I insist on in part, by the anti-feminist backlash of the manosphere. Class and economic factors also come into play, but the thing that I found interesting in this graph is that more and more women vote liberal. So I think that's why you see more and more Gen Z women being pushed by conservative media, like Brett Cooper for The Daily Wire or Amala Ekpunobi, who worked for PragerU. They are meant to reverse the trend by connecting with young liberal women. The pill is another element used by conservatives to replicate the sort of manosphere to conservatism pipeline onto women. All you have to do is replace the manosphere stuff with anti-pill rhetoric meaning natural wellness, divine femininity, against elite technology. And there you have your little trap. Now that this has been said, I want to ask a simple question. Why the f do we have to deal with all of this as women? Because people who menstruate are the ones getting pregnant, it appears to be our responsibility to manage contraception and fertility. We hear more and more people talking about male contraception or vasectomy, and that's great. But it's kind of limited to progressive middle-class spheres, and there's no real incentive to choose male contraception or do a vasectomy in our current society, quite the contrary, so I'm afraid it will remain quite limited until we create those incentives. I think we know it by now, asking people to do the right thing is not enough, unfortunately, you have to show that uh, they can benefit from it too. So for now, women are still expected to find solutions by themselves with the help of private health institutions. We mentioned the influencers selling courses on natural contraception methods, but another practice has gained a lot of popularity lately, egg freezing. An increasing number of middle-class women are now opting to freeze their eggs. I remember following Liz Plank, feminist tabulous, um, on Instagram. Um, she recorded her process, freezing her eggs with um, her friend. Egg freezing is, like contraception technology, an opportunity for women to gain greater power over their bodies. But as Vicky Spratt wrote in an article she titled I won't freeze my eggs, it seems like a money-making scheme which makes women feel terrible. She says private for-profit clinics promoting expensive egg freezing treatments feel like the latest iteration of capitalist attempts to profit from womanhood and the anxieties that we put on women. End of the quote. Spratt is right. When you look at how egg fertilizing companies market their treatments, the idea of buying time or doing the right thing before your late 30s comes back a lot. It capitalizes on the anxieties women have about aging and what it might mean for fertility. Like imagine the face I made when I searched for Liz and Monica's podcast after I watched a little video and so this. Race to 35. The year 35 fertility cliff has become the metric around which women who want to have babies organize their lives, including their contraception method, their relationships, the job they do, the place where they live. As Obi Gein, Spencer McClelland wrote in Slate, quote, the dread of age 35 is so pervasive that its effect bleeds backward in time, with women in their early 30s, and yes, sometimes even in their late 20s, already feeling as if they are behind in the race against their biological clock. There it is, the biological clock. Historian Jenna Healy says the first reference she has found in the media to a woman's biological clock was in a column in the Washington Post in 1978. So what this extract and what Jenna Healy's work show is that the concept of the biological clock grew alongside women's inclusion in the workplace. It targets new career women of the late 70s who naively put their career before biology and forget that the clock is ticking. It backlashes the fear they create among those in power with even more fear. I mean, look at this ad campaign for the American Society for Reproductive Medicine. Yes, it is an hourglass in the shape of a baby bottle. And I don't know about you, but the font reminds me of horror movie posters. Like, what the fuck is this? And I know some of you might be thinking, Alice, you can't deny the basic biological reality that women's fertility declines with the years. No, I can't and I don't want to. But it would be great to remind ourselves that, first, 
men's fertility also declines as they age. And second, the age 35 fertility cliff is a myth. In that same article I mentioned earlier, Dr. Mike Cleland explains that the way we measure fertility is outdated. Quote, Doctors have an obligation to put this to an end. While it is true that there exists a relative decline in fertility over time, the truth is that, in absolute terms, women 30 and over are still very likely to conceive without difficulty and at about the same rate as women under 35. One of the largest studies found that 78% of women aged 35 to 40 will conceive within a year compared to 84% of women between age 20 to 35. Now to conclude, I would like to go back to Liz and Monica's egg freezing journey. Liz collected an average number of eggs, but Monica didn't. The experiment was a failure for her, and that's really sad. The process is quite long, it is physically, emotionally, and financially costly. So Monica couldn't buy time, the anxiety of the biological clock was soon to come back. Liz, on the other hand, shares that the pressure of fertility can then transfer onto finding the right partner to have this potential baby with. So the pressure is still there, it's just been displaced. For the final episode of the podcast, Monica and Liz invited therapist Esther Perel, who explained that no matter what technology we come up with, women continue to forge their lives around this idea of having to find the right partner to then have a baby, when in fact, a lot of women don't raise their kid with the other parent. The egg freezing technology, as flawed as it is, still revolutionizes the way women have children. And so Perel invites Monica and Liz to think about how they can revolutionize the way they do family. Instead of trying to find the right partner, why not getting friends or community members involved into the process of raising the child? Why does parenting have to be conditioned to having the same genes? Care and provision don't have to be gendered values. Anyone can care and provide for others. Now, once we make that mind shift, we remove so much of the pressure put on women. We transform reproduction politics from a tool meant to control women's bodies to a tool that, in some sense, can liberate them. That's it for today. I hope you enjoyed it. As always, the conversation continues in the comment section. Don't forget to like, to subscribe if it's not already done. A big thank you to my patrons for their support and a special thank to top tier patrons Tinfoil Pancakes, Marshall, Trogdor, The Burninator, Brandon, James, Ojoal, Pablo, Patrick, Boris, Ivan, Ria, Toki, Corigi, Andrea, Patricia, Tristan, Ian, Lenny, Donage, Alex, Ren, Manuel, Jay, and Christopher. And thank you to the other ones who prefer to stay anonymous. Finally, I need to talk to you about um, Squarespace, our sponsor. Squarespace is an all-in-one platform to grow your presence online. They give you a bunch of tools to create your ideal websites. So this is mine so far, Alice Capel. Um, I use it as a platform to kind of show all the work that I do on YouTube, my contributions, but also my book. I also added all my social media accounts. You also have analytical tools. You can run effective email campaigns. On their website, you can also get advice from professionals on how to build your website, etc. So many things you can do. So if you're interested in it, if you want to try it out, then go to squarespace.com to get a free trial. And once you're ready to go public, then you can go to squarespace.com slash alicecapelle to get 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring the video and yeah, that's it. I'll see you very soon. Salut!